This is a new initiative on behalf of the Markowitz Center for Applied Ethics to try to get information out to our public as quickly as we can in relation to COVID-19. Now, of course, things may change as they have been consistently over the past hours and days and weeks. And so when that happens, we will try to continually uh, put forth some content so that you can have uh, it and be best informed. Today, I have Subu Vincent, who is our Director of Journalism and Media Ethics Program. He's here with us. I'm Thor Waspotten, the Managing Director of the Markula Center. And of course, we're working from home and using media to be able to, to have this conversation. Subu, tell me through your lens of journalism and media, tell me about how you look at COVID-19. Uh, thank you for actually having me, Thor. This is good to, to do at, at an important time. The way I look at this is journalism uh, ethics itself um, has a way to help reporters and, and, and news workers determine what is the story, when to run it, how to frame it, and how to carry it if you're going live, uh, and, and all of the these things that actually happen in, in the newsroom. Uh, during the COVID-19 situation, there are three actual uh, I mean, scenarios. One, where the, where the facts are absolutely clear on the science, on the disease itself, and the transmittability of it. Two, where the area is gray in terms of data on what's being tested, what's not being tested, what's not known fully, and so on. And, 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 and three, where more new data has to come, where there's absolutely no research done at all. For example, vaccinations, the actual availability of it, and so on. Where journalism has most of its challenges is not when the absolute facts are known. Most of the challenges happen to come when it's an unfolding reality and there's actually a, a crisis and political leaders are saying and doing things that involve dubious claims almost all the time. And in that situation, journalists have trouble with, uh, with, with breaking stories that are actually live news when a political leader of a country or the top political leader of a country starts making false claims online and on TV and on social media that, that result in public behavior actually changing and causing more harm than good. That's partly the problem I'm seeing all the time. And the hydroxychloroquine issue that, that has arisen from the way President Trump has claimed that it is going to be a useful drug for people to treat the symptoms of, of, of I mean, COVID-19. That is an example that led to hoarding, that has led to doctors actually I mean, fraudulently I'm prescribing it for friends and family and pharmacists going up in arms saying this is not fair. So these, this is just one sliver of an example of what can happen when both social media that exempts politicians in the name of newsworthiness, that lets them say whatever they want, and breaking news television coverage that is not able to figure out a paradigm for what to do when the top leader of the world can, can say whatever they want, and in the name of false equivalence, in the name of giving equal share of time to, to different people for different I mean, perspectives, they just release facts that are not even true. That's the challenge so, so, I feel is important at this time. Right, but so Subu, uh, at the Markless Center, we always look at through our framework, stakeholders and identifying stakeholders. In this case, I'm looking at journalists and those in the media, and I'm also looking at the public, the people that need to be informed. What should journalists do? What should the media do to, to uh, be able to convey the appropriate information at the appropriate time with, when all this chaos is happening? And then how do we as the public navigate television, print, social media, where most of us are getting most of our information? So those are really the $64 million questions for ethics at this time. Um, I agree. One of the challenges that journalists are not able to reckon with is when there's a demonstrated case of people misinforming and disinforming on, on live, I mean, press conferences, should they even continue to cover that leader live? And this applies to any leader in the world. It doesn't necessarily apply only to what's happening in the US. Uh, there is no protocol in journalism and driven by ethical uh, framing that you maybe do stoppage. You just stop covering people live or you do delayed coverage like 30 seconds or 60 seconds or 
five minutes where you fact check the claims and then you actually put out stuff that's programming, but not live programming. This is something that is very controversial because of the partisan nature of some of the leadership. Uh, this is hard to do, but there is no, there is not even an attempt among news editors to actually come together to have a serious conversation given this is a public health issue. Now, if this was about nuclear war, weapons, if this was about impeachment, one can understand those are, those are political issues. This one is actually a public health issue. On the social media side, the very design of policy has been to give all politicians exemption because what they say and do is considered newsworthy. That's also a, a news value. In fact, there's an overlap. There's actually consistent commonality between social media and breaking news media on that one element that they are willing to give politicians newsworthiness as an exemption uh, at, at the time they go live. And what's interesting is both algorithms and human journalists cannot tell the difference between fact and fiction if a politician is actually speaking live. They just cannot. You have to wait to figure out whether what the person said was actually true or not. So when you look at stakeholders, it's not just the journalists and the people. It's also doctors, health workers, pharmacists, and all of the other people in the healthcare supply system who are all impacted by behavior running, uh, uh, I mean, just completely at free will for everybody to do whatever they want. That causes more problems than it actually solves. I mean, for example, the assumption, so, I mean, when the president says you can do a coronavirus test anywhere, just ask for it and you can do it, which he did on March 6th or so, uh, that was actually a completely false claim. That gives people the sense that, you know, testing is ongoing and, and et cetera, et cetera. That has led to the impression that whatever number of infections we have now in, 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 in the US today is a valid denominator uh, of total people who actually have the infection, but we've not even tested as much as, as we should because these tests are not even available easily. Um, so there are serious implications that come when, when you frame the story and you frame the coverage led by the claims made by those who are leading the actual I mean, response at the time when there's a lot of gray area in the data itself. Subhu, thank you for the conversation today. All right, thank you, Thor.